The IMF alone was not going to be able to fill that gap, so we had to also raise bilateral, multilateral additional support from the World Bank, from our G7 partners, from the European Union, and others of seven and a half billion, and we had to accomplish a debt restructuring to reduce the pressure on our balance of payments over the next four years by that remaining 15.3 billion. And that's how over the next four years we focused on reducing that balance of payments gap such that, again, we could maintain some type of macroeconomic stability, rebuild our central bank reserves, provide for more confidence in our currency and in the overall economy. We were successful in uh, approving that program. We were successful already in two tranches, receiving two tranches of about $6.7 billion. And we have received, started to receive the financial support that was promised to us by the World Bank, by the G7, by the European Union. Last but not least, the restructuring for the most part is complete. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that before moving on. We had several months of very complicated and difficult negotiations. Finally came to agreement with our ad hoc creditors committee to restructure, to propose a restructuring of 14 of our sovereign and sovereign guaranteed bonds, a total of $18 billion that the country owed. Again, I repeat, these debts were taken on over years and years, and they were overwhelming uh, given what's happened in our economy. We could not just simply repay them on a timely basis. The hard currency did not exist. The deal that we agreed to was a 20% debt reduction for so-called haircut on that stock of debt. So that's uh, $3.6 billion of relief, debt relief, that we could achieve if the restructuring was approved. And then we also moved out the payments on the principal that were due four years in a, a, a further so that we would not be draining our reserves to repay this debt. Uh, we thus have re reduced the debt load for today. We've reduced it for good, but we've also enabled ourselves to have a breathing space of four years while we're in the IMF program. We had to meet three criteria. The three criteria had to do with our overall debt sustainability, by the end of the program, we had to come to some 72% debt-to-GDP ratio. We had to reach this balance of payments relief, 15.3 billion over time moved out. And third, we had to agree that when we restructured it, we wouldn't do it as a balloon, such that we exit the IMF program and have a new problem the next day, having everything due, but instead agreed to a stable financing of debt after the program of no more than 10% of GDP in any given year. Uh, we also agreed to a very important mechanism, which I've gotten a lot of criticism of, so I'll spend it just a moment uh, telling you my perspective. We agreed in return for that debt reduction to something that the market right now requires in almost every debt reduction or haircut case, and that's a GDP warrant. Something that turns our creditors into, in essence, equity investors in Ukraine. And the reason I think that this is a very valuable tool is not only because the market demands it and it's typical of most recent debt restructurings, but because you and I both know that we have been challenged and we have been struggling for 23 years to attract the critical quantity of investors that the country needs. We did something in Ukraine that's revolutionary by creating a whole new class of investors interested in one thing, interested only in the real economic growth of this country going forward. These GDP warrants are worthless if this country does not succeed. Those GDP warrants are worthless if investors never come back to Ukraine. Those GDP warrants are only worth something if we achieve growth together with investors of over 3% per year going forward from 2021. And so I'm actually quite proud of the fact that we created a new investment vehicle that not only is being provided to those who agree to a debt restructuring, but it is a separate actual instrument, separable from the debt, which means it will be a tradable instrument, which means we created an entirely new capital market for Ukraine. Again, no one gets any payments if the growth of 2021 through 2040 is not over 3% of GDP. So I think we can all be proud if someone ever gets a payment, and we've achieved this, and we have now created a whole new class of investors who are, share the same exact desire that the Ukrainian people have, which is to have real economic growth. But this well-found, um, I think, stability, this actual bottoming out of our economy, which we see in terms of industrial decline and inflation slowing, the, the, the currency being relatively stable. This stability is not enough for the people of Ukraine, and it's not enough for uh, the government of Ukraine. The government of Ukraine, together with the president, coalition and parliament, are absolutely adamant in moving beyond stability. 
If you're a sick patient, as Ukraine was post-revolution, with 10,000 euro in its bank, in its treasury accounts for a country of 45 million people, being able to breathe, being on life support, being able to uh, once again start thinking and, 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 and speaking is not enough. The sick patient needs to be able to get out of bed. We want to not only walk again, we want to run again. We want to see real jobs, we want to see real growth, we want to see real, the real economy return to something exciting, not just for financial investment, but for the average, average everyday citizen of this country. And so how do we get from this well-developed uh, stability, this incredible effort that's gone into stability, how do we go from there to real growth? I think it's clear that we need to do a great deal more. There are many areas uh, of reform that are still required that will take time. Uh, I will speak in more depth about the area that I'm most involved in, but in, in, in general, the idea is to deregulate as quickly as possible the economy, to free up business from the burden of regulation, and also, of course, from the uh, attached corruption. Second, to privatize everything that can be privatized of the state-owned enterprises. To do that in a way that's clearly, over and over, transparent, fair, efficient, and we can prove to investors that not only is there an opportunity, but that the process is one that leaves behind our very untransparent past. Third, anti-corruption. Broadly speaking, anti-corruption touches every single business, it touches every single individual. On anti-corruption, one of the biggest things we've done so far is in the area of the national police, something that every average citizen driving the streets of Kiev or Lviv or Das or Kharkiv knows has changed. Is there not? waved over by a militiaman with a stick and a handout. Uh, we've actually helped, started to create across the nation a police force that serves and protects. But aside from the national police, there are a wide variety of very interesting policy developments in the government. In our own ministry, we've created eData. eData is an online service which provides every citizen of Ukraine and outside Ukraine, anyone with access to the internet, with full transparency of every single treasury transaction that goes on in this country on a daily basis, thousands of transactions, and the ability to analyze them and to see who's spending what money. How are the taxpayer dollars being used? The next step before the end of the year is to put all revenues of the consolidated budget online, and then as next year, all the expenses, so that by the end of 2016, the entire budget, and that is both uh, central and local, will be online. As you can well imagine, that is a very critical step, transparency and opening to the public how we spend our funds. But it's not enough. There are other uh, elements of transparency that have also been very important. An, uh, an ele electronic or e-procurement system has been rolled out throughout the government for state purchases. Again, it's not only a matter of efficiency, it's also a matter of transparency and putting corruption behind us. Third, very important access to data, other databases, whether it be property databases, or, um, uh, I mean, real estate or other property databases. Anyone can look up my last name and find out exactly what I or other government officials or parliamentary officials uh, own. Again, transparency to avoid corruption. And, and finally, electronic services have been very important in this area. So being able to register your business in 48 hours online for Ukraine is really a novelty, and it does work. Uh, being able to get your birth certificate, marriage certificates, your divorce, documents online. It's critically important to avoid standing in line, burden, but also, we all know, to avoid corruption. So all of these things are a big part of what's been happening. The last, the last piece of the puzzle from my perspective is tax reform. And with tax reform, let me just give you a few words about where we are and what we're focusing on. We spent six months listening to business, six months interviewing different industrial groups, different business uh, branches, talking to Ukrainian business, foreign business, talking to uh, multiple uh, reformers from other countries, Slovakia, Georgia, Estonia, other countries in the Baltics, about how they implemented tax reform, trying to pick the best model for our situation. And of course, we'd all like to strive to cutting taxes to zero. I mean, the best tax rate for any business is no, no taxes. But that's not a possibility. We have a state to fund, so we need to find a combination, a, a tax reform proposal that was both investor-friendly, uh, and I'll describe what I mean by that, and also fiscally sustainable. There's no way for us today to wreck the, the sustainable, the, the stability that we've created by providing lower taxes. Because you and I know that if we provide the lowest taxes in the world, but we cannot assure 
currency stability, if we cannot assure inflation, if we cannot assure that we remain in our IMF program, business is not going to look at and value that lower tax as, as greater than all of what I just described. So it's that combination of sustainability and investor friendliness that we need to find. What we determined was that we, we wanted our tax system to contribute to fairness, transparency, solidarity. We wanted to help increase investment, economic growth, job creation, and we wanted to improve public services for business, remove the opportunities for corruption. Because it's not only tax rates, it's the tax administration, and it's the burden and the subjectivity of the tax officials, the customs officials, that bothers business. It's been an unfair and complicated system, system for much too long, and because it's been unfair and complicated, it's allowed for enormous manipulation, which has created an enormous amount of injustice. Everyone needs to pay taxes in the same way. All companies need to be in the same equal competitive position. You can't have companies that are paying their, 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 their taxes legally competing with companies who are evading taxes and expect them to be competitive. If we continue with the process that we have in place today, our legal tax paying businesses will be driven out of the market. That's the last thing that anyone wants. And that's the last thing that's good for the budget going forward. So the, the first task was to develop something that was fair, simplified, transparent. And to achieve this, we proposed, generally speaking, a flat tax over the key four areas, meaning VAT, personal income tax, corporate income tax, and the social payroll tax. By proposing a flat rate of 20, for those four taxes, we have already reduced the administrative burden and the subjectivity. Today, those four taxes have not over 90 different tax rates in our system. So every time a tax authority comes to your business, he's making a judgment already about whether you applied the right rate, which rate did you apply, why did you apply that rate. We've invited him in, in that way, with that compl complicated nature of the tax system, to harass business to subjectively make a determination as to what's right and wrong. We eliminate that from the, from the get-go. But it, it's not simply about those four tax rates, it's also about uh, the tax burden. And yes, we have one tax in Ukraine that was extremely high, which was our social payroll tax, it was 41%. And it was causing people to act in a way where they would pay a minimum salary officially, so they had to pay 41 on a small amount, and then pay the rest in an envelope behind everyone's back. Not only was that bad for tax revenues for the state, but you know the citizens were losing because their pensions were being calculated only on the minimal amount that they were being paid officially. And then later we have problems where citizens cry and yell and scream about the pensions being very low. But that's because we had a, a system that based their pensions on something that wasn't transparent. So lowering that burden from 41 out of 37 on average to 20 it's a very important part of this proposal. At the same time, uh, the, um, the reduction going further will depend on whether or not we de do indeed bring people out of the shadows. So the Ministry of Finance is suggesting even further reduction over two years once we see that people are coming back to the market and once we see that people are coming back and paying their taxes. The third goal of trying to be fair, uh, we tried to achieve in several ways. One is that we have something called a simplified tax system, which is Russian the Sistema here in Ukraine. And there's absolutely every reason to continue with that simplified tax proposal for true entrepreneurs, micro and small businesses. The Ministry of Finance supports it entirely. What we're trying to do, though, is limit that privilege, that tax benefit, to true entrepreneurs, true micro and small businesses and not enable large businesses to use it as a tax optimization or tax evasion scheme. Because once again, if you walk into a retail business and they're paying their taxes fairly, everyone working there is an employee. If you walk into another business that's evading taxes, everyone working at the cash registers has been uh, registered as a sprushness or a sim simplified taxpayer. And the difference is enormous. It, can't, it should not be allowed to be abused in that way. In addition to that, there's a simple social justice issue. Average salary for Ukrainian employees is about 4,000 hryvnia per month. Not a large amount. So if you have an average Ukrainian citizen working at a factory, working a hard nine hour day, eight hour day, he's having his taxes withheld by his employer, by law. And he's paying currently 15% plus 3.6 plus a military tax plus the employer is paying uh, a 37%, 40% payroll. Very heavy tax burden on that poor individual and on the business. 
On the other hand, if you have a professional, I won't name which profession, making $4,000 a month, he qualifies to be a specialist, a flat taxpayer. He pays 4%. There's something not just in that system because the average Ukrainian citizen doesn't have a choice. He's employed by his firm, the company withholds his taxes, and he's not able to evade or optimize. So there needs to be a coming of closure to this. So the one issue that we, that we focused on is limiting it to businesses that have revenues or pe individual entrepreneurs that have revenues to a certain amount. Truly entrepreneurs, true, on, true small and micro businesses but not providing it for what is the upper middle class in this country, which ought to be either an employee or pay the personal income tax. So we're trying to bring that top part of it back into some type of social justice, some type of fairness in society. Um, there's also something very important in, in simplifying taxes and, and reducing the burden, eliminating the subjectivity again of the tax authorities to come in and question what you're doing. Very much of this is about the state fiscal system and improving our, the administration. But we've also very much focused on how we get investors to come back and put in new capital into their existing businesses. So there is something called an investment tax credit in the corporate income tax. An investment tax credit which under certain circumstances, investment in new capital, new equipment, new technology can actually reduce your taxes payable. So if you're a profitable company, and you invest that profit into the capacity of your business, you can reduce directly the amount of tax that you, that you, that you owe. I want to be uh, perfectly clear here that it cannot be done unless we at the same time reduce our expenditures. We cannot in this country reduce our revenues, which this proposal does. It reduces revenues by about uh, net 60 billion divinia. You cannot do that unless we reduce the expenditure, the spending of the government. Because as I said, macroeconomic stability, which means maintaining a tight budget deficit, is critical for us to continue. We cannot do this at the expense of our budget deficit. We cannot increase our budget deficit by this amount of money. So right now where we are in the government is trying to identify those areas where we can be more efficient in government, where we can, by implementing structural policy changes, whether it be in education or social safety net or in, in health, where we can reduce expenses, not by reducing the benefits received by the most needy in society, not by reducing the minimum wage, not by reducing uh, the subsidies for energy, but instead by becoming more efficient and in, by becoming more efficient in reducing expenditures, providing a better service to society, providing better services. Um, that's all in an environment that you know, since we are not yet at full peace, requires us to continue spending very high levels on our military. So we have been spending last year over 5% of our GDP. We'll be probably spending close to that this year. Um, and so it's a very, very difficult game, which answers the question why it has not yet been submitted to Parliament. Because as a responsible government, we're trying to pull, put together the two pieces of the puzzle together, the tax reform and the budget for 2016. Rather than proposing one, reducing revenues, without providing the responsible answer on how we're going to reduce expenditures. <coughs> I expect this to happen in just the next few weeks. Um, but on tax uh, administration, I want to be very clear also, the tax reform and the re revisal of the laws on, on taxes uh, are not the only thing we're doing. So whether or not that passes, let me be very clear, the reform of the state fiscal service goes forward. This year alone, we will reduce the number of people in the state fiscal service by 30%. That's some 18,000 people who will be removed from the state fiscal service. That's tax and customs in Ukraine. Simply by reducing that number of people, you understand the business processes of the state fiscal system will have to change because you can't function the same way when there are 18,000 fewer people. It forces a change in the way we do business. In addition to that, we just went through the illustration process, finally. I don't know why it didn't happen a year and a half ago, but it didn't. Uh, and 42% of the upper management of the state fiscal service has been removed uh, under the existing law in Ukraine. Aside from reorganizing it structurally, aside from making it smaller, we've started to have a very, very uh, positive kind of communication with business. Yesterday we spent hours with the ombudsman, the business ombudsman, which was established by the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. 
on the basis of the complaints of business. He established a report where he gave us the trends, what's going wrong, and suggested solutions. And we went through you know, over 40 different proposals from the business community about what's really happening. And most of them have nothing to do with legislation. It has to do with implementation, it has to do with policy, it has to do with incentives in the state fiscal service. Are auditors incentivized to send your case to court? Or are they incentivized to try and reach some type of negotiated solution with you? Are auditors incentivized to go back and back and back and back to the companies that have paid their taxes? Or are they incentivized to do that only in an appropriate case? Are there penalties, disciplinary or other, when they act improperly? And those are the kinds of things we're focusing on doing literally every day, regardless of whether or not there's tax reform, regardless of whether or not there are changes in the tax legislation. Those are things that are within our executive control and need to be done immediately. Let me just say that um, I think the goals that we have, uh, the macroeconomic forecast for 2016 of returning to real economic growth, 2%, with a 12% inflation rate, are realistic, they're achievable. In fact, uh, we should be aiming for even more than that. But they do require that we continue this reform program not just sit on our haunches on our laurels and be happy about what we've accomplished today, and there's an enormous amount to be happy about, but instead accelerate and move faster with those elements that I described to you, deregulation, tax reform, privatization, and anti-corruption. If we can do that, we can spark the imaginations of those investors who've reopened their eyes to Ukraine, who are again willing to take a new look at Ukraine, and we can turn that interest into real investment. As a former private sector investment, let me say, I truly believe, and I didn't vote. If I could, I would, you know, vote 12, 20 times uh, for Ukraine. Ukraine is a very uh, good location for investment today, and it is the right time to start looking again at investments and making investments in Ukraine. First, Ukrainian assets are undervalued. Successful investors who try to oper operate in a counter-cyclical mindset will understand that the best opportunities will be today and not when the rest of the market sees it and all the prices go up. Second, the depreciation of the currency, as painful and horrible as that was for each and every Ukrainian citizen, has driven our exports to all new levels of competitive strength. And there are sectors that benefit from this dramatically, whether it be agribusiness, small manufacturing, IT. We have a very well-educated, everyone knows this, and very competitive workforce, but as of January 1st, with the full implementation of the EU Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement, we also now have full trade access to the European Union market. And this makes Ukraine geographically and intellectually and competitively an extremely valuable uh, export platform for not only the European Union, but also beyond. Third, our current wages are less, less than a sixth of those in Poland and a third of Romania's. I assure you that if we're successful in this reform, that will not remain. <laughs> they will grow. So now is the time to take advantage of that and help us to grow and help us to remain competitive. Mm. Fourth, Ukraine has uh, the most reform-oriented government and coalition that it's ever had in 23 years of history. It does not mean that it's without problem. It does not mean that we agree on everything. That would be impossible. But when push comes to shove, when reforms need to be adopted, whether through the parliament or the cabinet, they are adopted with the support of the coalition, with the support of the president and the prime minister, with the support of key coalition factions in our parliament. And so, regardless of how complicated and hard it is, and trust me, you know, I wish it was easier. I have to head not back to the cabinet ministers, but to the parliament right now. Um, I, I will say that right now, making investments and helping us to get back to real growth, helping Ukraine to take its rightful competitive place in this global market, will assure that the next governments, whoever they may be, will be even more reform oriented. We should not allow for right now uh, the uh, pain that we've all endured to overwhelm us. And we should instead focus on continuing and finishing the project rather than looking backwards and unraveling or rolling back what we've already done today. Last, I'll just say that given the reforms are starting to bear fruit, uh, given that it appears the worst is behind us, I think the foundation for return to growth, return to a brighter future for Ukraine and Ukrainian citizens is ahead of us with your help. So I urge you to be a part of the return of that sick patient back to full running strength. Thank you very much.